Yes. Okay, to the next slide. So this particular session is brought to you by uh, Profiles International in conjunction with um, Ms. Mary Mokindia and Mary Mokindia Coaching and also Catherine Tolle, who are both five behaviors are practitioners and at the same time ER practitioners and coaches. I will go a little bit into uh, their profiles as we start. Um, as profiles, these are the things that we do. We are in the area of assessments and psychometric assessments and that. So if you're looking to get a recruitment assessment to assist your company in terms of uh, uh, recruiting great fit, people who, have, uh, uh, who, who are better fit for the role um, and you would like to use a psychometric assessment to be able to determine which persons coming in through your door are better fit for your culture and your role, then speak to us as we have what we call the PXT Select. If you want to understand the personalities, not only just in your team, but also in the organization, what we will offer you is our happy product. We call it our happy product called Everything Disc, which really gives everyone a language with which they can discuss um, what their priorities are and preferences are, and really help us to enhance communication amongst ourselves. And then we also have the brand Genos, which I think is not new to any of us here. And Genos really um, is, our, is, is the one that tackles the conversations around emotional intelligence. All the people in this call, Mary, Catherine, and myself are certified emotional intelligence practitioners, meaning that we can administer EI assessments for your team. We can also um, facilitate conversations and trainings around EI, and we can also coach for EI. And then the last but not least product is Cross Knowledge, our digital learning product, where we try and um, bring learning to you at your phone, at your desktop, and make it self-paced and take advantage of the digital tools that we now find ourselves having when it comes to learning and transformation. And then, of course, not forgetting the five behaviors of our cohesive team, which is why we are here today. So a little bit about Profiles International. We are what we call a representative of one of the companies um, in Wiley. And the Wiley brand is an organization that has been around for about 210 years and has been excelling in the area of research and education. So I'm sure if you went through uh, some books called Dummy 101 for, I mean, Chemistry for Dummies, or Chemistry 101 for Dummies, Physics 101 for Dummies, well, the people who published these books were the Wiley Company. It was actually called John Wiley and Sons. And over the years, they have gone into the area of research and especially in the area of talent learning solutions. And talent learning solutions means the, 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 the area we find ourselves when it comes to um, leadership trainings, team trainings. So the products here that we speak, that speak to um, learning, especially in the workplace, are as a result of a lot of research done by Wiley. So Wiley have been around for around 210 years. You can imagine that depth of knowledge. And of course, have a lot of revenue based on the amount of business they have been able to generate over all those years. As you can see, we have about 15 million researchers and professionals either directly employed or we collaborate with still in the Nobel laureate space. And we have published very many journals um, that speak to science, that speak to research and development. And really the promise for Wiley is to give to the world through research and education. The next brand that we represent, and I'm trying to see if the slides can, can move, is, uh, is the Genos brand of emotional intelligence. So the Genos brand is something I believe that um, has possibly gotten a bit more recognition from um, everyone around this room because it is what um, is in the background of all the offerings we have in terms of emotional intelligence. So our assessment and our training programs have been winning the training and assessment uh, awards in the training industry um, since 2017. And I know the badge for 2022 is not here, but we've actually won this six times in a row, speaking to the fact that um, we really, really are world-class. We are available in all these countries, including East Africa. And the Kenyan franchise here is actually in charge of the Genos Pan-Africa region. That means that we're working with people from North 
North Africa and Tunisia. We're working with people from West Africa. We're working with people from Central Africa. And we're really looking to increase our reach within the Pan-African region. We are an ICF business solutions provider. And that means that we are a partner when it comes to delivering a, a lot of our programs, especially in the general emotional intelligence um, area, where they, um, they see us as speaking to one of the key competencies of coaching, which is emotional intelligence. We can move to the next slide, please. Okay. So we're really here to speak about the five behaviors of a cohesive team. So our main agenda today is to introduce you to the five behaviors of a cohesive team, to also introduce you to how DISC or a personality assessments is important when we're speaking about the five behaviors of a cohesive team. And we hope that when we leave you at the end of this webinar, we will have explored the best practices when it comes to the five behaviors of a cohesive team. Of course, we only have one hour, and which is why we encourage you to sign on to our master classes. So we're only able to share so much, but as they say, awareness is curative. So whatever little we share here, we're very sure that you shall find value when going back to your teams tomorrow, the day after, and possibly in the next coming months. Next slide. So the next slide is a video. Do you want to talk a little bit about it before I press yes. play? Great. So there's a question I asked as we started um, this um, conversation, and I asked, what is a team? And I want you to humor us and right on the chat, what do you think a team is? And I'm seeing that someone who said here, yeah, could this be team building 101 for dummies? <laughs> James, well, no, well, so, well, I don't, I don't know how, what to answer to that. Mary, what do you think? But not for dummies, maybe just team building 101. We can remove the dummy section. Yes. But essentially, it is team building if you take the words as team and building a team. Essentially, is how to make a, a group of people who are working together for a goal really act as a team. And it will be interesting to see what people say a team is from their perspective. And I'm seeing here. Go ahead. Go ahead, Vicky. Vicky, you there? If we've lost Vicky, then I, I see that Helen Vicky. has said. She's speaking, can but you hear uh, there's no sound. Vicky, we can't see you and we can't hear you. Can you guys hear me? Am I mute? You can hear me now. For me, now we can hear you. Now we can hear you, though we can't see you. Go ahead, Vicky. Ah, um, so um, I'm asking, um, what do you think? What is a team to you? And someone has responded. Helen has responded. Mm -hmm. And Helen says it's a team. It's a group working together towards a common goal. And Docas also says that it is a group of people who have one goal and one vision. And Lee says it is like-minded group to the same goal. What do you think? Interesting. Yes. I, I, I might, I might, I might pick it a little bit. I see Julia has said players on the same side. Aha. Uh -huh. Interesting. Uh -huh. Players on the same side. It's a lot Wait a bit here, and hopefully they will get to hear more and more as we go. Vicky, okay. there's a lot of noise coming. Okay, I'll play the video.
go ahead with you. <laughs> I don't know if you could hear anything, but could you at least see something? Mary, um, Kathleen, did you hear the, the video, the sounds? The sound wasn't very clear, but at least we could see the video, which was yeah. self explanatory, yes. But you could see, yes, because it is, it's just about the act of um, a group of people coming together to defend themselves in very creative ways and ways that they have been learning, or I, I guess over time, on how to defend themselves. So that video is just meant to provoke your thoughts around what really is a team. So I want to ask another question. What do you need to run a successful business? You can put your answers in the chat again. What do you need to run a successful business? What do you need to run a successful business? Anyone? People, mm -hmm. Maximilian says people. Julia says adequate resources. Another answer or two, just to keep it going. A uh, product or service, people and system, that's Maria. Uh, James Mohia says factors of production, that is labor, finances. Hey, that takes me back to school, man. What were the factors of production? Assyrian says a good strategy, achievement and goals and resources. Uh, Helen says clarity on vision, goal, number one. Alana says expertise, people, strategic direction. Uh, Doka says strategy. And Terry says plan, people, product. And I guess all those is knowledge of the business. So all those things are there. We need technology, which is the how we do things. The premises is the where. We need the product, which in this case is the what. We need the business strategy, which also falls under the how we shall do it. We need finances. But all these things, you could have all the money in the world. You could have the best business strategy. You could have fantastic technology. You could have the best office in the world. And you could even have a great product or service. But what makes this all come together and come to life as a viable business venture or even not just a business venture, but a viable uh, uh, activity to engage in is actually people and it's actually a team. It requires a group of people to come together and make all these things work, you know, like put them together in a sufuria and make them all work to achieve a common objective. So with that, uh, Patrick Lencioni says, it's not finance, it's not strategy, it's not technology. It is teamwork that remains the ultimate competitive advantage, both because it is powerful and so rare. So you can have the best technology, but without a team, mm -mm. you can have a great strategy, but without a team, uh -uh. you can have a lot of money. You probably spend a lot of it if you don't have a team until you get the right team. But creating for cohesive teams is both difficult and simple. Simple because the elements that make a great team are not that rocket scientist, but difficult because it requires input and time to keep practicing the habits, the daily habits that allow us to um, create a conducive or a co cohesive team. So Patrick Lincioni in his book talked about the five dysfunctions of a cohesive team. And when Wiley were researching into why this particular product is such a hit, is because um, he wrote the book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team and uh, kind of wrote down what are these five things that if a team doesn't have, um, a team cannot develop what we call cohesion. But on top of all that, there was the need for people to understand how they bring themselves to these particular dysfunctions or these particular um, functional items, if you have to call them that. So each and every single person has their own unique way of bringing themselves to the conversations of a team. And that is where the other powerful brand, Everything Disc, comes into place. So you have two powerful brands here that wrap up together into an assessment 
And they also wrap up together into a powerful program that if you run over time, you're able to harness um, the power and the habits that develop truly cohesive teams. So your disc style influences your behavior. So I've seen there, James Moore here said that great teams are anchored in trust, but each and every single one of these styles brings itself differently to the conversation of trust. And we're going to go through this as we delve into the five um, functions of a cohesive team and just see how each and every single style will see trust and in fact, it is the ability to recognize and understand these differences that allow us then to be able to know that, yes, we might be coming to trust in a different manner, but we are all well-intentioned and we are all working towards building a great and cohesive team. So the five dysfunctions of a cohesive team actually are represented by this particular triangle. And it starts with trust. So a lack of trust, means that people cannot share freely. And trust is the foundation for any team to really truly develop towards committing and, and achieving collective results. When there's a lack of trust, then you find that conflict, which is the second um, behavior, is compromised. Because for conflict to happen, there must be trust. We must trust that we are conflicting around issues that are important. And so when conflict doesn't happen, then the third behavior becomes a bit difficult, which is commitment. Commitment means that we have committed and we have bought in to a particular idea all the way forward because we have listened to all accounts and have found that this is the way that we want to go. When we commit, then we're able to do the fourth behavior, which is accountability, meaning we're able to hold each other accountable to a collective set of items because we have buy-in from everyone. And we have clarity uh, of vision around what we want to achieve. And then that allows us to then focus on the fifth behavior, which is results. And not just any results. We call this collective results because results could look different as we, sh we shall see shortly. And if we do that, then we not only work together, as you can see the, the rallying call at the bottom is, we actually rise together. We work together to to achieve something collectively. And once we do that, then as a team individually, we're able to rise together or to Nainuka Pamoja, yeah? So we can look at the five elements and I say, I want to hand this over to the team to take over from me. I think they do um, a brilliant job, Catherine. I think Catherine, you, this was yours, trust. Yes. Thanks, Vicky. And thanks for laying that foundation. And maybe before we talk about trust, you know, James Mohi has said, great teams are anchored on trust. So what is trust to you? When we say great teams are anchored on trust, or we say trust, you know, in, a, in the work environment, what does trust mean to us? So I'd like to just, you know, just put it in the chat, what trust means to you when you talk about trust at the workplace. What does that mean? Let's see a few um, thoughts, trust is. Vicky, yeah. meanwhile, Vicky, could you mute yourself meanwhile? Any thoughts? Shall I go on, Catherine? <laughs> yes. Trust is reliability, uh -huh. sharing full information regarding a matter rather than piecemeal info. Uh -huh. Trust and trust in this context, we talk about trust in terms of vulnerability-based trust. Trust where you know, you're able to feel safe at the workplace because without trust, we judge, and we feel judged. And I'm sure all of you have been to meetings where nobody is speaking. It's not that they don't have ideas, it's not that they don't have anything to say. But if you dig a little deeper, you're likely to find that there's no trust. And therefore people feel judged, people are afraid, and therefore people don't speak. But when there's trust, team members feel valued, they feel appreciated, they can be open, 
they can say what they want to say and they don't feel that, you know, once they get out of the room, somebody is going to say something negative about them. They're being able to open up. They can be transparent. When they trust, people can admit mistakes and they don't then think, oh my goodness, if I admit this mistake, everything, all hell is going to break, break loose. They can acknowledge their weaknesses and they can ask for help. When there's no trust, people poise. They have this poise that I'm okay and therefore cannot ask for help. And how trust and the disc style interconnect is that the D style, the four styles that Vicky has talked about. So the D, the dominant, they project strength and they project mental toughness. Then the C, they maintain emotional control. At all times, they want to project emotional control. And for these two styles, they see vulnerability as a waste of time, as too touchy, and may look upon it with you know, disgust or disdain because they then feel, no, it doesn't project the toughness that we have. Then for the S style, they are comfortable with sentimentality, but privately, they don't want it to be seen openly that they have, they are sentimental. And for the I style, they, you know, they hardly filter information, even if it is deemed as inappropriate. And sometimes you find then this style play out in whether we have, we extend trust or whether we create those safe spaces or not. So being aware of our disc style actually becomes something that helps us in our attempt or in our quest to build trust in the workplace. And as we build trust, as Vicky said, then the next thing that comes to mind is conflict. She said once trust is built, once that foundation of trust is built, what then happens is we are more able to have conflict. But when we talk about conflict, I'd like to hear what are some thoughts that we have of what conflict means to us, because conflict can be seen in very many ways. So when you hear the word conflict, what images does it conjure up for you? <laughs> Let's hear a few, a few thoughts. I think Kenya I'm ready for aggressive don't like conflict. It would be nice to hear what people think of conflict because we've been brought up not to have conflict. I always find this yeah. interesting. Go ahead. Yeah. So what are some what are some ideas or what are some thoughts we have of conflict? What comes to mind? A lot of people will say kusomewa, you know. What <laughs> comes to mind when you hear conflict? I can see here there is a the constitution of Kenya does not allow freedom of speech. It allows freedom of speech, but does not guarantee that, that freedom. freedom after. Yes. yes. Uh, interesting. I think Idi Amin used to say that a lot. Yeah. So conflict yes. here could be dissenting viewpoints, a clash or disagreement, often violence between two or more opposing groups. But in this context, Conflict is around ideas. The conflict that in within the five behaviors we lean into is conflict around ideas. And for his teams allow for constructive debate of ideas, people could disagree with each other, but they are able to disagree respectfully. There's no fear of defensiveness, there's no hostility, there's no resentment. When there's trust, people can actually be able to speak up and air their views openly. And that's what cohesive teams do. But when the team is non-cohesive, there's less contribution, people are more quiet, people keep thoughts and feelings to themselves because any disagreement is seen as an interpersonal uh, disagreement. You see as if it's me you're attacking, as opposed to you just have a different opinion on the idea I am putting forward. So in this model, we talk about conflict around ideas. As we build trust, we are better able to have conflict around ideas. We can have healthy debates about ideas without attacking each other, without putting each other down, without feeling a need to, you know, uh, a lot of people like to say dressing each other down, without doing any of that, but just having it constructive debate around the ideas that we want to put on the table. 
And how do the different disk styles then play into conflict? And we'll see, um, you know, Mary, we could go to the next one. And we can see that the D and C styles, because the D style is fast paced, it's assertive, very skeptical, and they like to speak up, then they are likely to see flaws in other people, people's ideas. And it's the same with the C styles. The C styles are moderate, they're very reflective, they're perfectionists, they want things to be orderly, things to be correct. So they are likely to voice objections. You know, and they are likely to voice objections where they are not clear on what the person is being able to say. So this is how we see, you know, the DNC styles, they see flaws in other people's ideas. Then the I and S styles to be naturally empathetic. And they desist from shooting people down. In fact, the S style will, you know, very subtly try to redirect the conversation over and over again, where maybe they are feeling like, you know, they are not liking the direction in which the conversation is going. The I style will voice their concerns, but they let it go if they feel like it could affect the relationship. And they easily place themselves in the other person's shoe. And therefore are able to sometimes be thinking, okay, I won't even say anything because then it might offend the other person. But what we're saying is that when they trust, relationships can withstand certain tension. And because of that, then we are better able to have this constructive debate around ideas. And irrespective, then as we understand our disc style, we're better able to know this is how I respond. I tend to be more skeptical. But when trust is built, you're better able then with that awareness to be able to manage how then you respond in order to allow for that constructive debate, to allow for people to bring in their ideas and to allow for people to be able to contribute without any fear of any repercussions. So this is how then conflict plays in. And you can see the build up. Without trust, the conflict becomes then something that is very difficult to have at the workplace. So then how does that build into commitment? Mary, you can take us into how does that then build into commitment? Mary? Sorry, I was on mute, I forgot I was on mute. These are the new times where we always say, you mute yourself, you're frozen. I was saying, thank you so much for building, for, you know, building it up that you know uh, vulnerability based trust is important not predictive trust i.e i don't even have to have known you or met you then you've talked about uh, conflict productive conflict because that's where creativity and innovation lies i just wonder all all of you um see how many of you all 48 of you listening and i see names here that i haven't seen for a while and i'm so pleased to see friends and others who joined and also people i don't know who i hope to will join us for the course when we started, what rings in your mind when you hear commitment? And if there are any men here, this is not commitment to marriage, because I know many men, commitment, they take a mile and they run. But just generally, when you hear the word commitment, what rings in your mind? Commitment, you're committed, they're committed, they have a high level of commitment. Well, what rings in your mind immediately the word commitment and you see we all come from different cultural backgrounds different backgrounds different geological different um gender for you Eunice it means to show up that's a very good word to you commitment does somebody show up authenticity perhaps even uh Helen Ruto availability yes Caroline going the extra mile to make things work dedication to something Sally good to see you here and Karen to Maggie K going above and beyond you see we all come from different lenses different perspectives and these things mean different things to different people so when you're in a team a group we showed you a video about a group it's very interesting that you can be in the same group and that's why we teased you with a group but maybe you're in the same department, but you're not a team. You don't even have to talk to each other every day. Another one does banking reconciliations and another one does customer service. Maybe the, past, the person in the depot or in operations 
or in the sales center is more of a team for the person doing uh, credit credit reports and credit uh, waivers and showing who has paid. So it's really nice. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Caroline. Lovely to see you here. My coach, uh, our coach from ICF. All these things are, but let's see how they're defined in the five behaviors um, so that we are all on the same page. The first thing about commitment is clarity, meaning the team that is working together to deliver that result is clear about the overall direction and priorities. They are crystal clear because this avoids those meetings of meetings. So maybe even today, last week, you've been in a meeting, then you come out and say, hey, you guys, let's meet. What was said? Who did what? I, I don't think that will happen. Those water cooler conversations where people are checking if they understood what happened in the meeting because they did not feel comfortable asking. So clarity is so important. If you are leading your people and are wanting that team to be high performing, you don't want to have those outside the meeting conversations by the cooler. The second thing is buy-in. Is it, are the team members confident, everybody's committed? And that means whether or not they agreed, no matter if the entire team agrees or not, teams need to be clear on their objective and air their opinion to be committed to addition. That's why Catherine said, one trust, then conflict. You want to have a productive conflict. Everybody's got their own crazy idea. They debate it. Everybody feels heard. Everybody knows, okay. I gave my idea, people listen to me, but it wasn't taken, but you are all committed, i.e. you need to weigh in to the buy-in so that whether or not it was your idea or not. Now, what happens in commitment, and somebody said about putting your heart in it, so you're absolutely right. The teams are cohesive, they have their own goals versus the team goals. These little pocket vetoes, you know, like in the UN, where somebody is coming to veto a decision. 186 countries have agreed, but there's one guy who says, mm -mm, me, I veto, I don't agree. Or they say this is a priority, or they go about mouthing. When you have that behavior, you can know that is not a cohesive team. It's about my objective, my goal. Maybe it's because my appraisal, this is what I want to achieve because appraisal is based on individual recognition, not a team recognition. But when you have a cohesive team, they commit to the team goals versus their own team. Think about it maybe in families, where you have great families, you have a strategy as a family, this is what you want to achieve, despite your own personal thing, you say, no, I'll not do that degree, I'll, self, I'll sponsor my brother to go to go on that. I'll hold on my second degree or what I'm doing. Why? Because you have a team goal, all of you are committed to that one thing that you want to do. And remember, commitment is not equal to consensus. Consensus is dangerous. Consensus is not a way to work. It is commitment because consensus doesn't bring any positives around. So what happens when you have different personality types? I'm a D. Every time Catherine was talking, I was thinking, oh my God, this is D, me. I like, I'm dominant. I want to have control. I, I don't like to ask for help even when I'm dying during COVID times. So D and C's personalities. And that's why it's important to do this DISC personality assessment because then you know how to approach the different personality types. They are all useful to have, but they, they, you need to recognize your personality type and the other person's personality type so that you're able then to understand how to work when you're in a team. So the D and the C types, they are very skeptical. They're critical thinking. That's why Catherine was saying they'll always fast, fast, you know, pointing the flaws, flaws in ideas. They are more resistant to change, to resist and resent their thinking and, and preferences. Six style people, their difficulty is in overcoming the fact that not only their thinking is that it's not only their thinking is the most logical way. This style, when they overrule, and that is me, to be more patient, their egos and their passive aggression can take over. And I'm sure right now you're thinking of people in your team or maybe thinking of a supervisor in your organization, and you can now start to see where the problem comes in. Um, the I 
and the S style, um, they are more accepting. They want everybody to be satisfied. The style if they go with is group decision, even if they don't prefer it. So, again, that's a problem because they, 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 they tend not to voice their opinion and they want to have harmony. And the I styles will vocalize objective and will align with ease to the team's decision, but they may hold a grudge if alienated or hurt. Why are we saying personality is important? Because at the end of the day, we're social human beings and we work best when we are connected with each other and understand each other. And we'll move now to letting you know the reason we're having this free webinar is to really bring home that building a team, not a group of people, but people who are working collectively together for a result, takes energy, takes time, takes understanding personalities, and there are steps and there's research has been shown of how do you actually build a good team together that will be productive, that will have the right conflict. And we're having now a master series, the first ever. We and Catherine got certified in June. Um, Vicky and one of her team, Stella, had always been certified, but now we have enough trainers that can take you through a fantastic course where you get, get to know your personality and your team's personality, and you get a map of all the personality types and how each works against the other and how best to approach each personality on each of these five things that we're talking about. It's a fantastic map where if you're 10 of you, seven of you, you see your different personalities, which are going to have conflict, where do you work well together in every single one of these uh, blocks. We would like you to genuinely think about booking now. We start on October 3rd. It is part hybrid. We'll have one first one physical. And after that, we will run um, on it um, on, on uh, internet. Any questions you have, Please start putting in the chat. We'll try and keep 10 minutes at the end um, free. And of course, after 7.30, what we'll do is we'll open for the next 15, 20 minutes. And those of you who need to jump off can jump off. Anybody else can stay on and ask us questions so that you can start really having a high-forming, productive team. Over to Key so that you can start on account. Yes, thank you, Mary. Thank you very much, Catherine. So as I was looking at the presentation for from trust to conflict um, to commitment and now to accountability, I just wanted to paint a picture uh, of what is really happening when, when we are going through all these um, four items. So first, we are trusting each other. We're building habits and understanding that we are vulnerable to each other. If someone makes a mistake, they're actually going to come to you and tell you, okay, I have, uh, I mean, I, I was wrong. And so um, we start to understand that if a mistake is made, it wasn't intentional. And we also start to understand that if mistakes are made, they will not be used against me. So once you start having that trust, it means then you can conflict. And once you conflict, it means that your ideas can be tested. Me, uh, Mary, Catherine, and I can sit here and share all our ideas. And that means each of the theories we have will be tested and we'll finally say, ah, that one didn't work, this one didn't work, let's go with this one. But when we don't share, I go away with my idea and I don't allow someone to test it. So I might go away thinking that it's the best idea that was in the room, but I didn't allow anyone to test it, to put that theory to test. So I go ahead with a mistaken idea that my theory is the best. And so the third one, which is commitment, I cannot commit to because as far as I'm concerned, my idea was the best, but I didn't bring it. So when you lack that uh, clarity that your idea was not the best and you haven't bought in, then the fourth habit becomes difficult to do because the fourth habit, which is accountability, is one of the hardest ones to do because it means having to hold people personally accountable. So what is accountability to you in your words? And you can put it uh, on the chat and describe to you what is accountability? Now that I've given that whole um, narrative, what is accountability to you? I can see there are several messages. I'm looking at them on my screen now to do taking responsibility, that's from Benedict. And then I bet there's still a few more. 
So taking responsibility. So accountability and embracing accountability. I would ask you to think about um, a time when someone gave you feedback. It was valuable feedback, but the way it was said was a bit harsh, yeah? Or someone gave you feedback and you're like, now why are you telling me now? You know, you could have told me this uh, a short while, ago. I mean, before the event, before the fact, and it would have changed a, a lot of things towards the common goal that we have. So how, think about a time when those two things have happened to you. And if it has ever happened to you, either you got valuable feedback, but the way that it was delivered was, was a bit harsh, or that it came a bit late. You can give us a why on the chat and let us know, yes, you concur. I know Mary gives feedback and sometimes she's, she quotes it very nicely and puts flowers around it. And by the time you're realizing what you've been told, you're like, hey, that is the art of feedback. I, on the other hand, I'm still learning that art. Sometimes uh, the words run away, and then I have to go back and, and, res and resolve those words and bring them back to what the intention was. So I haven't seen any yeses. I, I don't know whether that means that uh, no one has encountered this particular moments of feedback. Mary, have you encountered any? Yes, <laughs> often. Sometimes, for me, I think people are a bit afraid of me sometimes because I'm a bit loud. I don't mean to be, I think I'm quite nice, but I, I come across quite tough sometimes. But it's always a bit too late when somebody tells you, oh, I've done that, that. And um, if you told me that last year, two months ago. So, and that's part of our character, understanding our style so that you're more open to ideas and to feedback. So people feel comfortable and safe giving you the feedback. Yes, so still goes back to the fact that for accountability to happen, there has to be some level of trust. If people have not learned the art of feedback, perhaps you might want to teach them uh, uh, the skill of giving feedback. But accountability, if we can now move on, um, means that we are holding each other accountable to something that we agreed on. So when you have meetings after meetings, that is me, uh, Catherine, Mary, and I have a meeting. And immediately that meeting is finished, I call Catherine to tell her about Mary uh, and what Mary did and what she should have done. That is having a discussion that could have been beneficial to the team, but not holding the person who really needs to hear that feedback or giving them the benefit of hearing that feedback. So accountability, uh, involves speaking directly to the other person, listening with empathy and offering solutions because we are going somewhere. We're moving table A to table B, I mean, from room A to room B. And so I'm telling you, you're not lifting high enough. You need to lift high enough so that we don't drag um, the feet on the, the, the legs on the floor because it's hurting the floor. And we said part of our goals was to move this table and not hurt the floor. So cohesive teams have to learn the art of addressing the subject matter directly and not talking behind people's back. So the thing about accountability is that it's one of the most, actually it is the most difficult of this particular competencies because it involves confrontation. It involves being able to walk up to someone and say, hey, we agreed that this was what we were going to do, but um, what's up? You're not um, handling your end of the bargain. Um, you've dropped the ball here and there. And then now waiting to hear and listen with empathy what's really happening behind the scenes. So, and different styles bring themselves differently towards the conversation of accountability. So if you're a D, of course you will be comfortable with confrontation, but the problem, of course, might be how you confront others. In fact, if you look at the assessment of these, one of the things that you find they are, they often find as a way of um, being more efficient is to watch their words, because for them, the, the, the language just flows. And if someone else also see the same thing back to them, it doesn't mean anything. So the, they have mastered the art of being blunt and truthful, which is not helpful to anyone, especially to the other styles, because it seems a bit disrespectful. So the thing about these is with their drive towards results, they have to be aware of the fact that they have to be less confrontational and to 
check with the words that they use. When you have an S who's the least comfortable of all the styles with confrontation, they have a desire to keep the peace. So it's about understanding that you will want to raise the issue, but if this is your style, it might not come easier to you. When you are a C, and you do not want to have conflict and tension, yet you are motivated by your need for accuracy and quality. You might be finding yourself um, doing what we call, what, what actually I think Catherine and Mary call the pocket veto. So put our hands in a pocket and we walk away. So no confrontation, but nothing gets done. You know those annoying moments where something has to move, but nothing is getting done because no one is saying anything and they have locked and they have a lot of valuable information. So you, and then again, you must also see the eye is very expressive. They tend to keep things positive, but when things become hit the, hit the wall and things are not moving, then they might tell the other person off and say sometimes things they might regret as opposed to speaking to the behavior. So sometimes if we are not aware about ourselves, we might start involving ourselves in what we call a bit of social conflict and forget to address the actual issue here. Confront, uh, accountability involves confronting people, not about themselves, but about that behavior that is not enabling um, the results that we want to have. I think I've set the stage for Mary to come on board back and tackle what kind of results are we talking about? Thank you, Vicky. And the one thing that I really enjoyed about learning about accountability is that contrary to what I thought and many of us think when we're in teams is that the boss is the one who holds people accountable for the results. And what I learned here, and it kind of makes sense, it is actually if the peers hold each other accountable, the boss is the least person who should be holding people accountable. A real cohesive, effective team holds each other accountable, and that makes it easier for the boss, for the supervisor, for the leader, for the team manager to really deal with other leadership things and not have to be chasing people like cats and herding people because everybody is accountable to each other. And this is quite a different perspective that we don't think that we as a team should hold your peer colleague or your team member um, accountable. I don't know what you think about that because that's one thing for me it really raised. Absolutely. So moving on, yeah. So moving on to the kind of results we are we're talking about is <laughs> think about is it individual results or is it group results? Many of us, particularly if you're in ESCO reporting to a CEO, you think of my department results, my team's results. But do we how many times are we really focusing on is a total cohesive reports of the group results? Is that strategy plan? Is the, P, the total p &L? And that sort of start to ask yourself, who really is in your team? As I said earlier, you know, you could have people who your team who makes you effective. Is somebody in finance? Is somebody in credit? Is somebody in risk? Is somebody in sales? Is somebody in operations? Those are the people who truly Despite the organizational chart, the way it looks, those are the people who are critical to you to make your work and your perform you deliver your performance. So thinking around the fact that sometimes a team can be a group of people who are not necessarily put there by the organizational chart or by their physical location, but people who are working together towards a specific collective result. And in this day of technological advancement of AI, we really need to think about teams differently because very few people now achieve things on their own. It is a collective action of a number of people that makes those results come through. So who is in your team right now? As you're thinking, as I'm talking this, just think to yourself, I'm a leader, I'm running, uh, you know, uh, I need to deliver a particular result for my organization or for my business, who is in your team? Who really is part of that team? Just think about it and, and, and mull about it because it's something when you come for this course, we will need to tackle more so that you clearly understand what is a group of people and what is a real team 
that achieves uh, results together. Because, for example, if you're an exco, is ESCO your team or is your department your team? Which is your team? For those of you who are here, please put in the chat. If you report, for example, to the CEO, your, that's what we call EXCO, Executive Committee, who is your team? Is it your department that you head? Is that your team? Or is it the, the team that you belong to as ESCO with the CEO? Anybody just give me some quick answers and I see. I've seen Julia, you're here, Dorcas, you're here, Janet, you're here, Benedict, Maxima, Carolina. Who's in your team? Maggie, you're here. Ambassador Gina, I saw you, you're here. Who's your team? Is it the team that you lead or is it the team that you belong to to do a, a to bring a result? If you're not giving me a chat, let me tell you. The team, if you're in Exco, the A team is the Exco team. Your department is what allows you to deliver the result you're supposed to deliver to Exco. So your A team is Exco. That is a team because that's where you are there to bring that result that you've been charged. The team behind you that you lead, that's a B team. But your A team is that good team. And it, this will be interesting for us when we go into that training. So what we talk about here is that great teams deliver collective results. They set aside the individual needs because of their desire to accomplish and focus on what's best for the team. Because we know projects suffer when we focus on individual goals as opposed to collective goals. People talk about my budget, my department, my people, my ego, my status, my numbers, you cannot touch my budget. It is not yours. It is for that collective team. So the idea is you need to desire to accomplish. And emphasizing that collective result is so important. Unfortunately, and some of you know, some of you here are HR managers, the way we reward, and that's why we say the world is changing very, very quickly. We need to start thinking, how do we compensate our people for results? Do we compensate individual action? And that's why people are into silos fighting about my budget, my people, my department. I need my people promoted. My people achieve performance because it's my, and then you're fragmenting because today is teams that achieve results. And it's very important then that even the way we recognize um, giving of results, we should be thinking about the total because there are so many distractions that lack of shared rewards bring, make sure people are not working for collective results. There's no process or structure. When people are focusing on personal goals or advancements being promoted, taken to London, where there's lack of drive or agency, when there's vague and shifting growth, it's so important that we, we, if you want the team you lead to give you those results, it should be on a basis of... Um, those collective results. And the styles matter because the D style will focus on outcome of the result. How do they sometimes is not their, their problem, but then they need to be reined in on that ego, like mine, to focus on those collective results. I want this get here urgent. And you know, I'm sure you've got people who says, you work for me. Eh? You don't work, eh? you work for me, it's me. I told you to do it tomorrow, eh? it's me not for the team. So you need to rein in those D energies. They're very good to helping you achieve results, but they're not good sometimes for the for dynamics. The I style, their energy is to initiate, but sometimes they need to focus on movement. They focus on movement, camaraderie. They're all about people and influencing instead of results. So sometimes you have to bring them back in line and say, look, yes, it's nice. Everybody loves each other. Kumbaya, excitement, but we need to achieve the results. While the S and C styles, for them, results is not the priority. They want to see quality, steadiness, but of course the result. Are. So teams need to push themselves to increase revenue, find new direction, but these team members would feel or may feel like fish out of water if they don't focus on progress and processes. So for the S and C styles, it's important to bring them in at 
Vicky, I think now I'll be bringing to you to, to wrap it up. I can see we are three minutes over the hour. I people have been patient with us if we could wrap it up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. And that in a nutshell is the five behaviors of a cohesive team, as written in the book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Cohesive Team. And so um, it isn't um, a one size fits all. It, it isn't that we'll come and we'll have the same conversations with your team and have the same conversation with another team because each team has different dynamics, but it will all center on trust, on conflict, of commitment, accountability, and results. And the team that sees actual results or movements, because we've done this over a number of year, years, is the team that commits. So at the end of this particular program, we actually have what we call a team contract with the teams that really want to, to, to see the, the, the habits that they develop. And these are things that the team commits. So the one thing you find is that you are putting together a, a series of habits that you're committing to practice, to build trust, to encourage conflict, to ensure everyone has commitment, clarity and buy-in, to hold each other accountable. What are you going to be doing when someone starts talking to someone behind their back? What kind of um, rewards are they going to be? And then last but not least, to keep focusing on the collective goal. Practicing those habits in themselves is already a, a big win, as we know. Once you're able to just show up as a team to just those habits themselves, you're already leveraging on something that's going to move your team from one place to the other. And uh, there's a lot of um, research done on just how, if you focus on the super team, the one that Mary calls the A team, the one that delivers the collective results, then the other teams, seeing that this team is working together as a unit and not fighting each other in terms of, uh, you know, this was my budget, this was yours. So that silo thing from up there spreads all the way down. So those ones, when they start seeing that these people are speaking one language and when they come, they're telling us to speak one language, then you get the results coming in at really, really uh, exponential. So we have a few books that you can read. And the first one, of course, is by Brené Brown, The Master of Vulnerability, and it's called Daring Greatly. She actually has a few other books out on vulnerability. So as a leader, it is a great book to start reading on uh, how to develop vulnerability based trust or the courage to lead. And then we also have Connecting with Colors by Mary Robinson, another book on just how to um, see how we bring ourselves to these conversations, how we color our world and our priorities through our own personalities. And then of course, the five dysfunctions of a cohesive team by Pat Patrick Lencioni. So all, all these books are available. Should you want the five dysfunctions of a cohesive team, we can have that ordered for you from the profiles office. And we do hope that this particular uh, session has been informative to you. And that um, when you see the our rallying call down there, we do not want to work together. We want to rise together. We want to inuka together. I think it's uh, it's the hashtag of a company. Because once we work together, once we focus on our collective results, our individual goals are also met. So I would invite uh, Catherine and Mary if you have any other closing remarks before we take any questions. No, I, I'm... I'm very happy, uh, Catherine, you go ahead for me. I love this slide that says the ultimate competitive edge. We are looking for a competitive edge to deliver results. We know the stress, the world is moving so fast. Technology is changing. The world is in a VUCA environment. You need your team with you working at the highest level. And how do you get that ultimate teamwork so that you don't stress and strain yourself? and uh, where they work for you and you work together competitively, this is a competitive advantage. That's, that would be my plug for this because I've seen it work. Thank you. And I think for me, what I'd say as a parting shot is, it, you know, this works. Once you start to build safety, once you start to build trust, once you people begin to feel confident and feel safe and feel like they can be themselves at the wrong place, all the other four all begin to fall into place. So these are some of the things that, you know, in the masterclass we will be talking about, how do you build that vulnerability-based trust? How do you lean into conflict? 
how do you build that buy-in? So this is, I mean, it's one of those things that once you're able to get it, you can actually transform the way your team delivers results phenomenally. So I'd encourage you to just, you know, come and come register for the master class and let's see how we can build more effective teams and more cohesive teams. Okay. Uh, there's a very good question by Caroline Karanja um, to you, Vicky, or to any of us. Is the training for the leader of a team to implement cohesiveness? And I guess the flip side, or is it for the whole team? Very interesting question because I know sometimes you refuse to do training if someone critical is not there. Go ahead uh, for you. Mm. So for the masterclass that we are running um, starting November, it is actually for an individual who wants to get further insights into what can they do with their teams, what habits can they start um, practicing with their teams. And it is a hope that once you have been able to go through the program, then you would invite your team to then take it with you um, at a separate occasion. So that's why it's a masterclass. It's actually not the session itself. Now, should you feel that you are ready to take this program with your team, that option is also available. You just have to reach out to us. Um, the address is on the is on the screen there, info at profiles.co.ke, or the number is there. Um, 0722457777 and tell us that you would like your team, wherever it is, to go through this particular program of trust, conflict, um, commitment, accountability, and then results. And then that becomes a separate um, team um, program that we then run separately from this particular one that we're having on November 3rd. So I hope Carol have answered your question in terms of what this particular masterclass is about but then also what we can be able to do for you and your team. And your when you take the training with your team, it's not for the leader, it is for all of you. So the leader must be there as a team member first and then a leader second. Yes, yes, excellent. You've said it very well. Any more questions? I see we've lost some people, but still a very good group, quite a large group still here. Um, and I see you know, a few comments here. Uh, Maggie got it, and with Janet Umulindi said, very insightful session. Thank you so much for that. So let's ask questions. Let's talk. Do you want me to remove the presentation so that we can see each other and now just chat and ask questions? We all learn every day. I learn every day. So let's ask each other questions. If you want to share, be very happy for us to share perspectives. Any I certificate of Yeah. Could uh, you answer that? Is it for this session or for the for the masterclass? Yes, there is a certificate. Um, for these sessions, we don't give certificates. They are too short. So the answer is yes. Any other you questions? Will I stop the presentation so that we can have the open forum? Mm, I don't know if there are any other questions. I'm looking on the chat, but I can't see any questions of yet. I'm seeing thank you, thank you, thank you, insightful session. Um, Habil is saying certificate. Yes, yes, and you're very welcome, Habil. We can share with you the details. The link is on the, on the chat. Feel free to, to register. And for that, you have a certification for the master class for sure. Okay, we have James saying trust. Um, Forever. Nice yes. to see you here, James. Yeah. Um, there's a question Benedict, how can people like Gregory House who are a problem but have results? You can take that one, Catherine. Or Mary? Who's Gregory House? I'm sorry, Who's I don't Gregory know. Gregory House, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, Helena, the customer student is Yes, we do. Thank you, Mary. We just need to put uh, the number for your team. And we will please reach out to us, and we will definitely give you a proposal. Um, the, what I would say to Benedict, I remember, um, was it today I was talking to an international, uh, a group of international clients, 
And we're talking about empathy, active listening, uh, providing psychological safety. And they were saying all the good leaders who are that, they hardly move up in his organization, but all the terrible ones live to the top. And I said, yes, but whose team produces the best results? And who's able to have a full life where you're able to have well-being, you're able to go home, not work overnight, not be supporting, all, because your team goes beyond, um, you know, uh, what do you call this thing, that discretion thing? They, 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 they give you, yeah, they really give you that discretionary effort where they, they go the extra mile for you and you have a far quality life and better. And as the world is moving now to understanding the importance of people and for that commitment, these Gen Z's, they, they, they can, I'm told that they, they resign on text, on Twitter, on whatever, you know, how do you keep a team motivated, happy to work with you and give you their best? It's not the old days of hierarchical uh, leadership where people were afraid. These days people say, you know what? I don't need to work here. Bye bye. So this is why it's very important for you to have a team that is committed, that is cohesive, that is productive. So there's a question here. Uh, when we talk about rewarding collective results, how can you ensure everyone is accountable? And that's where we talk about peer-to-peer -peer accountability. Because it's very difficult and not very sustainable if you're the one always holding people accountable. But if you've agreed you're going to Isiolo or you're going to Nanuki, then people are the ones making everything work and you're getting yourselves in Nanuki because no one wants to let the other down. So they hold, everyone holds each other accountable to what they were meant to be. I got the driver, I got the car, I brought the food. If I didn't get the food, I'll call someone, I can't find food, what should we do? Why don't we check here? So the work is still being done, even as uh, you are sorting out other things that are obviously have your priority. And that's why we say it has to be peer-to-peer -peer accountability. If you have to hold everyone accountable, then that accountability lever is not working very well. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? I'm looking at the chat as well. We spent 15 minutes. I think if there are no more questions, we'll be happy to say good night. I see people have stayed on even after. If you have any questions, that would be nice. If you want to put on your audio so that we can wave, that's also allowed. If not, that's still quite okay. And we thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. And we look forward to having you register for the masterclass, which starts on the 3rd of November. Um, I believe you have all our contacts and uh, we will be sending more information to you. It will come from Rose uh, Ojala from our office, but feel free to reach out to Catherine, Mary or I for any further details that you might need. Thank you very much for spending this time with us this evening and we wish you a lovely evening and God bless. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye. Shall we stop the recording? Stop recording.